What we do here is go back, 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 back. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> Reagan and Bush. Reagan and Bush. These are the words that grant me the curse. Oh, you're stealing my format. No, stop. You're stealing my format. Oh, We're all about saving animals here on the channel. We don't kill them. We're not about killing. Hey, you damn shit. Big mochi. Fuck. That's fan mail over there in the corner. He's not fucking dead. Oh, my. My girlfriend started an OnlyFans account, and uh, I think all of it is cool. Is that her last name? He's taking her last name. I'm gonna make you look like a, like an asshole. Really? Which isn't hard to do. The main reason Froggy was kicked from the card was for collaborating with Sam Hyde. Uh, we lost $250,000 on the event. I am responsible for creating a lot of hurtful and damaging content on this channel. Welcome back to YouTube History. In this episode, we'll be delving into the bizarre and ever-expanding legacy of iDubbbz. For years, he was highly respected among the YouTube community, but in recent years has divided his audience and caused loads of needless controversy. Controversy that happens to be both entertaining and sad at the same time. It's a really nuanced topic that I felt needed a longer video made on it. This is part one in a three-part series where I will be delving deeper into the history of the Cancer Crew. iDubbbz created his first YouTube channel on March 26, 2010, though apparently only uploaded two videos on it. The iDubbbz TV YouTube channel was created on August 30th, 2012. While he'd sometimes go by his real name, Ian, the iDubbbz name came from him dubbing over videos. The three Bs don't really stand for anything, but on multiple occasions he stated that it stands for beer, bikes, and booty, his three favorite things. Much of iDubbbz's first uploads were Let's Plays, a genre on YouTube that was still pretty new and popular. Ian managed to stand out due to playing indie games, most notably Overgrowth, Hotline Miami, and Gary's Mod. He'd upload these daily for quite a long time, with new series being introduced. 40, why does it say 48th anniversary? 48th anniversary of what? Of you being alone? On March 18th, 2013, he uploaded the first episode ever of Gaming News Crap, where he discussed and give his opinions on recent gaming-related news. This show really allowed him to express his own thoughts and get more comfortable on camera, something he had rarely done up to this point. Though of course, I have to mention the infamous video Slenderman Gangnam Style. Open Gangnam Style. Yeah, I don't know why he made that, but I'm glad he did. During later episodes of Gaming News Crap, Ian would end off on a segment where he roasts awful Kickstarter gaming projects. These were really well received by his at the time small audience so we decided to expand upon it. On September 18th, 2013, iDubbbz released the first episode of Kickstarter Crap, called The Unknown Virus. In it, he criticizes a Kickstarter project made by a couple of British teenagers who want to release their own zombie game. Alright, let me get this straight. I'll give you five pounds, you give me a used tampon or some shit. I'll give you ten pounds, I make the game. I give you 15 pounds, I make the game, then I have to give you a back massage. Does that seem right? This video isn't up on his channel anymore for some reason, despite the second episode onwards still being found. A big reason why this series did so well is that he'd not only make fun of these projects, but give legitimate criticism on why they suck. Plus some of these were scams or were going down the path of becoming a scam. Some were just amateurish, as certain projects were just random internet users wanting money to start up their own YouTube channels. Others include the Potato Salad Kickstarter, where some random dude was able to raise all the money he needed to make that very thing. Then there's the Anastasia Project, where a Breaking Bad fan tried to fund a sequel series. The I'm a Bee Emoji, Zen Egg, and the Feminist Photo Book as well. I can't say that I'm not excited about it though, because I, I, I'm really excited about it. There's a lot of shit to sift through right now, including this first quote here. If you would just wear makeup, you'd look so much better. Nine times out of ten, said by a woman to another woman. In a 2014 episode, iDubbbz talks about the pony dating simulator project called Dark Skies. In it, he points out how it seems the project was only made to scam money out of bronies. It turns out, though, that this project was a parody of bad Kickstarter projects, as it was made by none other than Sam Hyde. Him and his crew, Million Dollar Extreme, were the ones to make it as a big trolling effort, 
which definitely worked. You know, you kind of look like my dad. Maybe I should cut you up just for fun. You kind of look like my dad. Maybe I should cut you up just for fun. Yeah, this is a line that a pony is saying. What the fuck are you gonna cut someone up with? You're a fucking pony. The first real enemy of Idubs would be Sean Bishop, aka Pisces, who he talked about in two videos. I first discussed the project from the Cyber Matrix game console, which was nothing more than poorly rendered MS Paint drawings. A funding unsuccessful. Imagine that. Maybe people don't wanna don't wanna fund a crook. Maybe maybe the American people don't wanna fund your deception, huh? Ever think of that? Due to the episode, some fans of Ian funded the project ironically, allowing it to reach its minuscule goal. So, a second Cyber Matrix project was made to get even more money, which Ian also covered. This got the attention of Pisces, who made one of the most unhinged video responses I've ever seen. This is actually where the phrase, NIGGER FAGGOT, came from, as Pisces used it on iDubs. I wouldn't even count iDubs' next video as a response, but rather a roast. He eviscerates him to no end, one retard to another. It's beautiful. And I guarantee what won't happen is this. Did you guys see that? Is this. This is the problem with doing one take, is that uh, if you spit through the gap in your teeth in the middle of the video, you, you just kind of have to roll with it. In an early 2015 episode, Idubs discussed the self-made entrepreneurs project, which was really an attempt by rapper Caffeine to make money from his rap career. The business itself was all focused around him, so Idubs would go after Caffeine personally along with the Kickstarter. This led to Caffeine himself making a video response almost two weeks later, which is legitimately funny. Not being racist in any shape or form, and you look sick. You look like you need food. Something looks wrong with you. Go get a burger. Dude, what the fuck, Quaffine? I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends and you go and say I look sick and I should eat a burger? God damn it, dude. Not cool. Hashtag disrespect. Idubs would make a response back, asserting what he said in the previous video while adding on jokes. Also, Idubs' rap that he made for this episode is fire, not gonna lie. Sticky bottom Buddha. Sucky dicky monkey. Lumpy muffin mama. Saggy titty grandma. Creepy mitten mummy, wriggly giggly weenie. The feud between these two is pretty short lived since Caffeine realized how good this wall was for his bottom line. He embraced the meme hood and even re uploaded his response video after having previously taken it down. This series was what brought Ian into the limelight. It transformed him from an obscure gaming YouTuber to an upcoming commentary juggernaut. He'd go from 20,000 subscribers in late 2013 to 80,000 in late 2014. One of these new subscribers was Max Mofo. Another prominent YouTuber who was mostly known for prank calls at the time. I'll be mentioning him again shortly. The series would continue for a few more years, with later episodes talking about multiple projects all under one theme. Spin-offs were made, like one called Indiegogo Excrement, where he'd make fun of bad Indiegogo projects. Another called Where Are They Now would talk about the few successful Kickstarter projects he had previously discussed. After over 100 episodes, the final edition of Kickstarter Crap was uploaded on November 16th, 2016. Though, where are they now would last up until early 2018. While it was still popular up until that point, some other series Ian would make would start to overshadow it. On August 6, 2014, Ian uploaded the first of many episodes to his now iconic Bad Unboxing series. Obviously, as you can tell by the title, he just unboxes stuff. What separates this from all of other channels making unboxing videos is Ian himself. No matter what he opens up, he manages to make it pretty entertaining. At first, he begins by mainly opening up subscription boxes and other random junk, like toothbrushes, stickers, pencils, and loot crates. For a Halloween episode, he would dress up in his now iconic Tingle the Elf getup, in a video where he simply reviews a bag full of candy, while carving an orange as if it were a pumpkin. So now, 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 now we have our pumpkin unboxed and we do whatever we want with this pumpkin. I think a big part of why I still like these so much is just the sheer willpower this man has. He'd do anything just to get a laugh from his audience. The series is juxtaposed if I'm calmly opening something to him slurping down plastic glue. Are you familiar with Asian? I am. They make anime. The combination of Kickstarter crap and bad unboxing was a godly duo that really helped him grow in subscribers. In fact, by May 2015, he would finally reach 100,000 subscribers. 
For such an occasion, he made a special video, known for him shooting on a Draw My Life attempt and dancing to Uptown Puffs in the Tingle suit. Let's all just admit that he has some sick ass dance moves, and the fact he keeps a straight face throughout is hilarious. In an October 2015 video, Idubs would unbox one of the many packages sent by a mysterious man named Masaki. Though, you'll most likely know him by Samurai Buyer, which is also the name of his website. It's common knowledge that this company was a fucking scam made by a group of people who aren't even from Japan. They would reach out to random big YouTubers to unbox their broken shit in order to increase business, which kinda worked. Though, with Idubs, he would constantly troll Masaki, which is what made these videos so great. I've stolen his gay logo, and I put it on a sweatshirt, and uh, any proceeds from selling these sweatshirts or shirts will go directly to me and not Masaki. So fuck you, Masaki. Send your slant-eyed lawyers to come and write me a DMCA. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not gonna- I'm not gonna bend over for you anymore. Fuck you. Another saga of unboxings was one-up box videos. By the end, he would throw one of these boxes down the Grand Canyon while on a trip with his buddy Rajor. So I'm here at the Grand Canyon. Hopefully, you take me a bit more seriously this time. Around the same time, Ian would begin opening fan mail his subscribers would send to his P.O. box. Now if there's one thing I can guarantee, it's that Idubs fans are way weirder than him. I mean, it was common for them to send him dildos, anal beads, weapons, other weird shit, and Reagan and Bush merch. Not only is it funny because this election happened so long ago, but it's also funny because Reagan and Bush are hard right-wing conservatives. They'd never watch a crazy, out-of-control liberal program like mine. A meat cleaver? <laughs> Reagan and Bush? More like Reagan and Kush. <laughs> These specific uploads, along with another series that I'll be discussing shortly, were insanely popular. I mean, these would be getting 5 to 10 million views on average, but the most popular upload, the Game Magician one, having 18 million views. Ian's love-hate relationship with his subscribers was always really funny to see, especially the fan mail, or well, hate mail he'd get. Honestly, this show has so many fun moments that I'll just play my favorites. I forgot, almost forgot about the Nintendo 3DS. No way in hell that's gonna be a 3DS, you dumb mo fuck. Looks like it's a bag of dirt. Oh hell nah. Yeah, unfortunately it is, Clarice. I really don't like this puppet dynamic thing. You mind cutting this box open? Uh-huh. I thought this was gonna be a heartfelt letter. Turns out... It's just a giant illustration of a cock. Oh, it's the same picture of a cock posted every time, only slightly fucking cunt. Certificate of Achievement awarded to Gay Retard, and then says his signature nigger faggot down at the bottom there. I'll use this snake. You got the lotion snake now hanging out. Mmm, I smell really fucking bad. Orange is most certainly the new black. On the new season of Orange is the New Black, we're gonna break out of here. We're gonna break out of here. We're gonna knock down these walls, you see? We're gonna use dynamite. Dynamite made out of toothbrushes and soap. Which one of you lesbians got soap? I've only watched Prison Break. I gotta warn you, it's a bit cringy. Wow, got Reese's Puffs in my bowl. Wow, got my days on cruise control. Wow, it's stuffed. It's got a zipper in the back. It's stitched. Now we're gonna give it a little squeeze. This series lasted for half a decade, with episodes being posted quite often until mid-2018. When it seemed like the show was done, he came back with a revival of sorts in early 2019. I really liked the new direction he took, allowing fans to submit new intros and making the setup light into an absolute mess. Sadly, after only uploading four new editions that year, the series would end in September 2019. Though, I think it was a fine enough conclusion. Battle Boxing ran its course and currently has over 80 episodes. In July 2015, Idubs would first collaborate with Max Mofo, who I mentioned earlier as a longtime fan of Ian's. Max would visit him in California for E3 and to visit some theme parks. Good? Yeah? Oh. Watch one. one. A little one. Yeah? Good? Yeah. One more. One more. He, need, he deserves it. Maybe one more. No, no. You deserve it. It's, yeah. There you go. Yeah. 
These vlogs, released to Max's second channel, really showcased the two's amazing chemistry, which would lead to fans wanting more from both of them. What we didn't know at the time is how legendary these collabs would be, as a few other notable figures would form into YouTube's greatest comedy group. We'd first see them all assemble in November 2015, with the videos Hair Cake and Dumbass Gets a PewDiePie Tattoo. Now both of these videos are posted to Filthy Frank's channel, with Hair Cake being a sequel to Vomit Cake. And while that video was pretty good, its companion would be much greater. In said video, both Max and Frank would shave all of Ian's hair off in order to bake it into a cake. This created a running gag of sorts where Ian pretends to have cancer. Dude, it looks like you have, you have cancer or something, I dubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Some of his more ignorant fans legitimately believed he had cancer, which he addressed in this video. I'm one of the few content creators on this website who doesn't joke about cancer. Take any other channel, Good Mythical Morning. They should call it Good Cancer Morning because all they're doing is joking about cancer the whole fucking morning long. Jenna Marbles? You mean Jenna Cancer? All she's doing is joking about cancer the whole time. Pewdy cancer, you say? I am legitimately unsure if you actually have cancer or if it was one of those filthy Frank I have cancer jokes. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, one of those I have cancer jokes. Cancer is a very serious topic. I don't think anyone should joke about it. Of course, the three men are barely able to eat the cake, with Ian seemingly dying by the video's end. The next video would introduce Chad, or anything for views, who, as his name implies, will do nearly anything. This includes getting a tattoo of PewDiePie's bro fist on his left ass cheek, and the PewDiePie name on the right ass cheek. Idubs and the rest of the cancer crew merely antagonize him, with Ian then uttering one of his most iconic lines. What do you boys think? Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> Over the course of the next year, this collective would drop some of the craziest videos on this platform. That might sound exaggerated, but I don't know how else to describe masterpieces like Deadly Twister, <laughs> Edward Watermelon Hands, Stars, boss. and The Gentleman's Guide. Motherfucker! <laughs> ah, ah, what the fuck was that? Now, while most of these efforts were posted to Max and Frank's channels, Ian would upload two of his own. One is the Panda Nature documentary, a Looney Tunes style skit where Ian and Chad try to capture two giant pandas so that they can fuck. As you would expect, this doesn't end well. Whoa! What the f No! No, 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 not again, not again! No! 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 There was also a sequel to the PewDiePie video titled Genius Gets Idubs Tattoo, where Chad now has to get a tattoo of Ian's face on his right ass cheek. Along with the infamous Super Trash Bros video, some behind the scenes content we posted to their respective second channels. One of these, the BTS for the Edward Watermelon Hands video, would birth another iconic iDubs meme. Well, do one more one liner. Jump down, jump down, and then say some fucking gay shit. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> That summer, Ian, Max, and Frank would all go to VidCon 2016 together. They vlogged quite a bit of this, with parts of a new video being filmed. You see, they were collecting various ingredients from other YouTubers in order to create a new masterpiece. In August, Frank would upload the final part of the cake trilogy, titled Human Cake. In it, they bake a dessert using various fluids and other gross shit from YouTubers such as JonTron, Joey Salads, PewDiePie, KSI, Vsauce, and quite a few others. A wedding is then held between Max and Frank, with Chad trying to interrupt it. After eating the cake and throwing up, a massive fight ensues. Thanks for watching the last video of the cake trilogies. The final Cancer Crew video would be Deadly Twister 2, which is a really fitting conclusion. While in Adventure Time cosplay, the trio severely injures themselves to Chad's and our amusement. Three smash. <laughs> this is actually. He just fell my balls. This is real. This is real. It ends with How to Basic going crazy and ruining parts of the set. Idubs gets unusually angry and berates how to basic on his conduct. My, my ears fucking 
fucking ringing. I need to go to hospital. Why would you throw something solid, you cockhead? You could have actually killed us. You got into a fucking rage. It's not rage. funny. You got into a rage. That was insane. Uh, if you don't want to film for us, you don't have to. We could get someone else, okay? This would be the last time Filthy Frank appeared in a video with them, and a year later he quit YouTube altogether. You will now most likely know him as Joji, a successful music artist known for his many hit songs. Max and Ian would continue making content together, with more vlogs being posted to the iDubs TV 2 channel. I can't stress enough how popular these videos were. I mean, some got up to 18 million views. And during May 2016, he even reached 1 million subscribers. Though that was reached not only through collabs, but yet another new series that further put iDubs on the map. In August 2015, Ian released a video responding to reaction channels and their sudden popularity at the time. It perfectly sums up why people like myself hate them, and it gives him an opportunity to make some of his best jokes. If you didn't guess it by now, reaction channels make reaction videos to other reaction channels reacting to their videos. Yes, it's a golden ratio of retardation. That previous joke may have been a bit too advanced for some of the reaction channels in the audience. Here's some that might be a bit more your speed. Yeah, a little bit of slapstick. You like that? You like that? Oh, very good, very good. One of those Ian made fun of is Jinx, who at the time was the biggest reaction channel. He criticized him on his laziness and outright stupidity. But this wouldn't be the last time he talked about Jinx, as months later he released an entire video about the buffoon. A new series titled Content Cop, where iDubs would investigate some of YouTube's worst creators. Jinx really was the best for its target, especially with the feud he and Jack Souls were in at the time. But instead of focusing on Jinx's reaction content, Ian poked fun at his shitty original content. You gotta eat, sleep, and shit, YouTube! You gotta suck dick and shit, YouTube! Oh, this is so motivational. Holy shit! Oh, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna sit on my bed. I'm gonna sit on the end of my bed. I'm gonna set up the camera, and I'm gonna watch some fucking videos. Fuck editing. Fuck that shit. What am I, a faggot? The first episode he did insanely well upon release leading to Ian releasing a new installment less than two weeks later. This content cop focused on multiple channels instead of one, the amateur food reviewers who filmed in their cars. This was the first episode to include multiple skits, including one where iDubs reviews Peaches in the Sewer. Snack Dubs here back again with another legit food review. Today we're going to eat some s and peaches. Ooh! You bite the peach, the peach bites back. Now I know what a lot of you guys are going to say. Oh, iDubs, not everyone has access to a sewer. I'm not saying that you gotta eat peaches in the sewer to get views, but it certainly helps. This eventually spawned into its own mini-series called Legit Food Reviews, where Ian reviewed normal food items in weird places. You'll mainly know of the Sewer Pickles episode where Ian swims in contaminated water and eats a jar of pickles he placed in it. One great thing you can do with the leftover pickle juice is to uh, pour it on wounds. I got a little wound here from when I was climbing in the water just a minute ago, and uh, if there's any hepatitis C in there, the surefire thing to fix that is a little bit of pickle juice. Going into 2016, Ian would upload two Content Cop episodes on toy review channels, one in January and another in June. These channels were already under scrutiny at the time, so iDubs added to it by making fun of how all these accounts copied each other. He mocked the whole surprise egg trend, and even went to Toys R Us in a Spongebob onesie to make fun of these bratty kids. Bro embarrassed himself in public for amusement, and I couldn't be happier about that. Always cut away from you. Cut, a cut away from you. It's a Jinx bucket hat! Oh wow, Sam Pepper kill your best friend prank gun! I'm so excited! In part 2, he even made a bleach gummy bottle and took a fat bite out of it. The way I peel it open kind of looks like mozzarella cheese. In February 2016, Ian released the Fine Bros episode, which at the time was his least favorite episode. This was partly due to hopping on the hate train at the time, which was dunking on Benny and Raffi Fine for trying to trademark the term React. The catalyst of his regret was meeting the two at VidCon later that year, making him realize how pointless the content cop on them was. But in my opinion, I think the video holds up well. Not only did these two well deserve criticism, but the skits here are some of the best. Ian's friend, Raj, parodies the Bad Unboxing series, with Ian coming in to put a stop to this. Dude, lots of people pull out weird stuff from boxes. Well, look, you got some weird background on your on your monitor, Zabumafu. 
Dude, I used to love that show as a kid. We got a little gag going on my channel. Yeah, what's that <laughs> gag? Zabuma who? Zabuma fool. You know? I just got done watching the Fine Brothers video, and they told me to stop people like you. The Fine who? The Fine Brothers. The Fine Brother. <laughs> Ian made this to show the idiotic logic the Fine Brothers used when they tried trademarking a common term just to make money off of those making slightly similar content to them. And let's not forget the allegations made it years later on the grounds of discrimination. These guys were never good people, just greedy businessmen who cave in to hate to try to save their reputation. After three months of no new content cop episodes, Ian released a 20 minute video on Keemstar. He mostly ignored going over his at the time recent controversies, and instead went after Keem's character and inherent hypocrisy. It was a pretty scathing look at the dude, but the highlight was the intro and outro. He fights a gnome Keemstar in the sewers, and later on drags him out to a field and finishes him off once and for all. It ends with a parody of Smash Mouth's All Star, this time about how much of a douchebag Keem is. So, I'm making death threats and I'm calling people nigger. Counting that cash on my channel's growing bigger. Never you mind that I was already banned from my racist, homophobic, hate speech rants. Now, at the time, this episode didn't gain too much attention until a month later when Grade A Under A made his Keemstar video and started some drama. This gained the Content Cop episodes more attention, to which Keem even saw it and liked it. If there's one thing to commemorate Keemstar on, it's that he takes criticism decently well. In August, after the second content cop on toy channels, Ian released an episode on how to prank it up. It's a channel run by Dennis Rohde, where he makes shitty prank tutorials. Ian sticks to ridiculing his lousy prank ideas, while also filming various parodies of them. This prank is perfect to pull on someone who has celiac disease or is gluten intolerant. Grab that French bread and put it right in their hand. And then put that baguette, so you gotta sprinkle some of those around. Maybe you tuck a few down his shorts. Get another French bread, grab another French bread, and another one, and another one. They're gonna be so ashamed when they wake up and realize they ate all this bread, but extremely relieved when you tell them that it was just for fun. Dennis is honestly the person least deserved of a content cop on him, though his character was never under fire. Again, just the bad videos. In September, iDubbbz put out the Leafy content cop, which for quite a while was hailed as the best episode. It's framed around giving Leafy a taste of his own medicine, mainly by making fun of him in the same way he makes fun of little kids on the internet. Straight off the bat, I want to let all the newcomers to my channel know that I'm perfectly fine with bullying. Make fun of someone because they're fat, autistic, or riddled with acne, I don't care. Make fun of them. I think my only stipulation with the bullying is that you also have to not be a pussy. You see, because if you're a pussy and you're hiding your putrid malformed chin behind your hand, your sleeve, or your microphone, you're, you're showing people that you are extremely self-conscious. You're showing people that you're a pussy, and that takes a lot of the oomph out of your bullying. And despite what many have said about it recently, the whole thing wasn't making fun of him for his looks. In fact, this was done to prove how much of a pussy he is, as seen in the content deputy released a week later. Leafy just kept proving Ian's criticism over and over again. Ian also points out how lazy his content is, and how his attempts at demeaning other people fail. To cap everything off, Ian goes out in public to search for Leafy's chin, and decides that the only way to fix that problem is to help cover it up. We got a microphone? Alright. Bruh. Oh, perfect. That is picture perfect, my man. Only a month later, he released an episode on Tech Racks, a tech destruction channel that made pointless content. A lot of it is unnecessary and not satisfying. In order to prove that such content could be good, Ian tries doing the same. He fakes a phone drop test and gets caught by security and made to pick up the mess with supervision. The fact that he warned his buddy about this is some king shit. Take off. Now. Yeah. Wherever. Now at this point of the video, it's necessary to introduce a key figure in iDubbbz's life, Anissa Joma. Anissa began dating iDubbbz in October 2016, and has always had a controversial past. In fact, as she and Ian started dating, she was still in a relationship with a 17-year-old boy. And by the way, she was 24. She used to be a Twitch booby streamer and met Ian via Twitter. They would actually move in together in San Diego, and she would slowly introduce herself more in Ian's videos. The first main example of this would be in the next Content Comp episode, which all started with one infamous tweet. 
at idubs. So, three million people subscribe to you and you openly say the n-word and retard? Kill yourself. Once Tana Mojo released that tweet, Anissa suggested that she and Ian go to one of her meet and greets, not knowing at the time that they would be making internet history. The two vlogged the whole experience of going to Tana's show and waiting in line. Once it was their turn, Ian went up to Tana and said the now iconic line. Let's go up and take a picture because this camera is like from the Following this encounter, Tana released one of her very highly regarded storytime videos, in which she over-exaggerated every single detail. But what she didn't know is that the entire encounter was filmed, and finally shown to the world on February 6, 2017. This is easily the best episode in my opinion. It so wonderfully goes over the flaws of Tana, and why her content and character are so horrendous. Going to her meet and greet and saying the gamer word to her was not just to be edgy, but instead a way to bait her into making a video about it. She was not aware of it being filmed, so showcasing both side by side shows how much of a liar she is. He walks up to me and he kind of like locks his arm around me, like around my neck like this. And it, it wasn't like it was like a chokehold or anything. It was, it was very like firm and like tight, like I couldn't have really gotten out if that makes sense. I, I'll explain that in a second. And so the guy looks at me and he wraps his arm around me and he looks in the camera and he goes, say, and puts his thumbs up and then like blank and he says the N word, like hard R. N word, like say N word, like hard R. Like. Idubs also points out her blatant hypocrisy, as she had used the gamer word in the past in actually demeaning ways. You know you're a stupid nigger, right? You fucking nigger! His phrasing of either all of it's okay or none of it's okay is a hypocrisy argument. Tana was known to use other slurs at the time, so Ian found it weird that she would think only one of them is off limits. For some reason, people nowadays misconstrued this as an argument for using the gamer word. In fact, he kind of condemned using the word by saying how unfunny it is. Another point that people like Tana seem to miss is that you can critique people's use of the word nigger. You, you can even critique my going to your show and doing it in that sense. You can say, well, that wasn't even funny, because it really wasn't. I, I replaced say cheese with say nigger. How funny is that? Not really funny, but what is funny is your reaction to it. So yes, you're allowed to be critical of someone's use of the word. If you think it's not funny or you think it's cringy, leave in the comments. When you said the word nigger, my dick retracted inside of my body. And if you're a very observant person, you might notice a video from a year ago where I actually critique the use of the word when I'm doing a bad unboxing. The, the whole joke here is the nigger word. Let's laugh out loud in the comments, you guys. <laughs> it's incredible how much more intelligent you would have looked if during the event where I came and said, say nigger, if you just said, wow, you're a very uncomfortable person and you're not very funny. What a pathetic joke. You would have j just destroyed me. But you couldn't do that because you're the most predictable human being on the planet. Tana actually released an apology not too long after, as it seems she realized her mistakes. Or so it seemed as she continued to get herself into controversies, which she also responded poorly to. At this time, we didn't get another episode for quite a while, but it did finally come out. After an 8 month long hiatus, Ian released the longest episode ever on the notorious Jake Paul. Though once people clicked on the video, they were surprised to find out it was actually on Rice Gum, who Ian referred to as Asian Jake Paul. This was meant to not give Rice the satisfaction of having his name in the title or face in the thumbnail. It was a massive look into his many character flaws, all explained as the seven deadly YouTuber sins. It ended with the best diss track known to man, with Dave, aka Boy in a Band, helping produce the track. This song still slaps, and the part where PewDiePie showed up can never be topped. Yeah. So you don't wanna look like a little bitch, but dude, you gotta be crucified. How can you claim that shit when you're too scared to go in on PewDiePie? Little hot. Boy, PewDiePie! Shuck my 5.3 inch. Oh, oh shit! Idub's pre recorded footage for Rice Gum's response, which was seen as predictable. He failed at defending himself and made a shitty diss track where he removed the beat halfway through. This would end up being the final Content Cop episode, with the Content Deputy being uploaded on October 11th, 2017. It was a pretty fitting conclusion, though at the time, many like myself hoped for more. In the meanwhile, the episodes racked up shitloads of views. In total, all 13 episodes combined received over 300 million views, with the Tana one having 35 million, the Leafy one having 38 million, and the Rice Gum one having 51 million views. This was the defining series for Ian, but where would he go from here? 
Something I've barely touched upon on this video is the second channel, iDubbbz TV 2. Here he mainly uploaded vlogs, most of which showcased his exploits with the Cancer Crew and his goofy buddy Raj. He would eventually start uploading more varied content like his disabled Pokemon Go series, where he would play the app while on a wheelchair. It's of course where these memes came from. I have crippling depression. <laughs> I have osteoporosis. Uh, you broke my wheelchair. <laughs> But in 2017, something new would emerge, which brilliantly contrasted his edgier content on his main channel. On June 2nd, 2017, Ian uploaded the first ever episode of the Saving the Squirrels Initiative, or the SSI. It was a pretty simple concept. Ian would go in his backyard and catch squirrels in order to safely relocate them, though much of the time he'd end up catching something else. Ooh, there's a lot, there's a lot of poop in there. Ooh, but there's also a lot of little little friendly rats in there. They are nasty, but they're alive and they're healthy and they're ready to go. Freedom. Freedom isn't free. The first episode was very well received, with it now sitting at over 5 million views. What really elevated the series to be something special was Ian himself. His clear joy displayed on screen is contagious, and his rampant Looney Tunes antics were fun to see. Currently there are over 18 episodes of Save the Squirrels, with some still occasionally being uploaded. He even got How To Basic to guest star in an episode. Do you like squirrels? Ah! Are you ready to help me? Ah! <laughs> Where's the dressing? Mmm. In September 2018, Ian would release an episode discussing how Yoplait needs to change their cups. It was causing squirrels and other animals to get stuck inside them, so he began a social media campaign to do something about it. This is your only warning, Yoplait. If I see a rabbit getting stuck in this shit, I'm gonna go yonkers on you. Hashtag no way, Yoplait. He would post a follow-up video, but not much was changed about the situation. Beginning in 2016, Ian would begin collaborating with more of those outside the Cancer crew, such as Ethan Klein of H3H3 Productions. The two have made a total of 9 videos together, spanning both their channels, not counting the many times iDubbbz has appeared on the H3H3 podcast. Their best work together was These Glasses Cured Our Colorblindness, a spoof and critique of Logan Paul's second worst video. The one where he over-exaggerates his colorblindness and gives an over-the-top reaction when seeing a sunset with specialized glasses. <laughs> oh my god! Another new series released by iDubbbz was this Comedians Go Get Food video series. Only three were ever made, where Ian and a friend of his go get food on wheels and then talk. The first was with Ethan on the iDubbbz TV 2 channel, before uploading two more on the main channel. One with Raj and the other with Vsauce. These were honestly just nice relaxing content to watch. A big thing I noticed with this era of iDubbbz is that he could take any random video concept and make it somewhat interesting. He was rapidly evolving from his earlier shows, finding new concepts to please longtime fans while also keeping his content monetized. Something I and many other iDubbbz fans noticed in 2018 was his lack of uploads. He went from posting over 20 videos in 2017 to less than half that by 2018. And not only had he stopped posting any Kickstarter crap or Content Cop episodes, but bad unboxing was being neglected as well. He did post pretty decently on the second channel, but changes needed to be made. That's where the series iDubbbz Complains came into play. He had uploaded videos like this in his early days, but brought back the series in mid-2018. The first new one he posted was on portion sizes at restaurants, which would have been a boring topic if discussed by anyone other than iDubbbz. I don't exactly have the same level of aggravation when I go to a, a taco truck and I ask for uh, a tres taquitos, please. No one's saying, uh, eh, do you mean three Charmanders? No, I don't mean three Charmanders, you fucking faggot. He then released an episode discussing the firing of James Gunn from Disney after all tweets of his were uncovered. Ian defended James, giving context to the tweets and making fun of those offended over nothing. It's honestly one of my favorite iDubbbz videos. 
not only for the strong arguments being made, but the messaging overall. It felt like a callout on cancel culture as a whole, a term that was still somewhat new to the internet at the time. I'm doing a big Hollywood film adaptation of The Giving Tree with a happy ending. The tree grows back and gives the kid a blowjob. If you think this is anything other than a joke, you know, with the setup, the punchline, the misdirection, all of that, if you think it's anything other than a joke, then you are either the dumbest person on the planet or you're intentionally being ignorant so that you could further some agenda. Three-year-old was peeing on my head. They've highlighted that. You see, the person who found this tweet actually has to have a dirtier mind than the person who made the tweet. Because the person who made the tweet is making a, a water pressure joke. The person who found the tweet and highlighted this said there's something innately sexual about a child urinating on someone's head. There's something sexual about that. It's like, fucking no. No? Do you have a child? Did you teach your child how to pee in the toilet or poop in the toilet properly? Other episodes of iDub's complaints included ranting about the lottery, men who refused to neuter their dogs, school fundraisers, and Tom Brady kissing a son on the lips. Please stop kissing your kids on the lips. Please do not do that. It's not cute. It's not funny. Don't grab your kid's ass. Don't touch your kid in any fucking way like that. It's not. No. No, 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 no. It's not empathetic. You're not cute. You're not sweet. You're repulsive to everyone around you. Ugh. Going into 2019, Ian would actually begin posting a lot more frequently, not only with more episodes of iDove's Complaints, but other new series like his tier lists. He was actually one of the first YouTubers to popularize tier lists. Little Caesars hosted one of the best grime step beatboxing performances I had ever heard. For hosting Lucic Diamond Eyes, I'm gonna put Little Caesars in A tier, I mean, how can I not? This entire year felt kind of like a rebirth quality-wise for his channel. He ended off bad unboxing strongly, and was a lot more experimental, and even uploaded a new skip video. Titled Abuse of Robot Stepdad, Ian, alongside Michael Reeves and William Osmond, are forced to take care of their abusive stepfather, controlled and voiced by Eric of Internet Common Etiquette. It is very reminiscent of Ian's older skits with Max and Frank, though it holds up on its own. A month later, Ian would release a 50 minute long documentary called Full Force, which would gain massive critical acclaim upon upload in July 2019. It follows the bizarre life of Chris, aka Airsoft Fatty, a small YouTuber who made cooking videos and regularly posted light tipper fights with his friends. It was incredibly well made, from its production value, setup, and intriguing interviews. Uh, do you have any weapons on you now? Is that this one? Yeah. No. It does a good job at humanizing Chris while also being somewhat nuanced. Once released, it gained an impressive amount of views, with it now being his most popular non-content cop style video at 24 million views. Fans like myself love this documentary, making Ian as relevant as ever. Though following this, I felt like his content started to decline a bit, which can be seen with these uploads. They were still decent videos, but just felt more weirdly random. Ian was seemingly trying to latch onto commentary trends, which felt odd as usually he was the one starting trends. This can be best expressed through his less than 50% peanuts video, uploaded in February 2020. It's literally just 11 minutes of him talking about peanuts. Not much else to say about that. This got me really fucking mad. Fuming! Fuck you, planters. What I decided to do is buy more of these and break it down. See if it is really less than 50% peanuts. He did film a video in Australia with Max Mofo a month prior. The two, along with other boys like Boy in a Band and William Osman, start a roadkill cleanup business. Later in the video, Ian gets a fever and has to leave the country. It's a really disappointing ending to the video, though not as disappointing as what was to come. Not only was his content starting to decline in quality, but his reputation as well. You whore yourself out online, you whore yourself out in front of your family and your friends. March 9th, 2020. Idub's girlfriend, Anissa, posts the following on her Twitter. 
I'm very excited to announce my Lewd OnlyFans launch. Check me out in the link below. I'm very excited to provide cute cosplay photo sets and more. Once this was posted, the iDubs community went wild and began making memes of it. And looking back at these, they have aged phenomenally. OnlyFans was still a very new thing to most internet users, and the prospect of iDub's girlfriend now resorting to selling nudes online was really bizarre, especially in the sense that her boyfriend was still making bank on YouTube still. Many posted the idea of Ian being a simp for her, as most men wouldn't want to date a girl who sells titty pictures to mentally disturbed men. Another big reason for the backlash was the fact many of her followers only knew her for being Ian's girlfriend. It felt like she was directly advertising to iDub's fans. At first, Ian handled the situation well, with him posting this tweet, I'm done, fuckers, I'm done, no more Mr. Nice Simp. After that, the controversy died down, until two weeks later when Ian posted a new episode of iDubs Complains, one that unnecessarily stoked the flames. My girlfriend started an OnlyFans account, which is a website where you can upload amateur porn. Anything from double penetration all the way over to lewd cosplay, and everything in between. And uh, I think all of it is cool. Yeah, I know. I, I didn't think it would be a controversial opinion either. A good amount of people are just doing the reasonable thing and just making jokes and laughing about it. But there's a whole nother group of people who feel personally devastated and betrayed. You lied to us. First of all, I'm not your fucking dad. While starting off the video all calm and collected, he becomes visibly enraged at certain fans of his. One made a pretty good parody tweet which he didn't understand, and another had made a video rightfully pointing out the cons of having an OnlyFans. And then future jobs, they might be a little bit harder to come by. I think this is one of the most important opinions to highlight because it really demonstrates a severe lack of real world experience when you're saying that future jobs are gonna be harder to come by because of an OnlyFans account. Like, if you think this affects your standing or your social credibility in getting jobs, you are so sadly mistaken. Many were mixed on the situation, with Critical in particular giving a very nuanced take. I think people are way too fucking invested in internet celebrities, and it's just genuinely pathetic. Now, I don't agree with every point iDubs made in the video, and I don't think that's a big deal. I don't fucking hate him because I disagreed with a couple of points, and I think overall, this shouldn't have even been a controversy in the first place, but because celebrity worship is so normalized in the world right now, People felt so entitled to tell iDubs how to live his life and what he's allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do. It's his fucking relationship. Okay, so iDubs picked a 15-year-old to represent the other side of the argument, you know, the bad guys that disagree with him. Yes, the tweet was dramatic, but I don't expect a logical response from a young teen. And the fact to use that to represent the other side that disagrees with you is complete horseshit. Also, real mature putting this kid on the chopping block. It's like you're turning into goddamn Leafy. While Ian didn't look very favorable in this situation, many looked past it over time. Though some began digging into Anissa's shady past, like her previously mentioned 17 year old boyfriend, Matt. I mean, this is a junior in high school dating someone in their mid 20s. It's fucking predatory. I know this is a tired argument, but if this was a 24 year old man dating an underage girl, people would be a lot more creeped out. Here's an H3H3 H3 podcast clip of Anissa discussing Tana. Now, I think back to it, I'm like, I can't believe we literally harassed an 18-year-old child uh, at her show. So by her logic, if she thinks an 18-year-old is a child, then what does that make Matt? She's also been seen on a live stream defending Lion Maker, that Minecraft YouTuber who posted a 16-year-old girl's asshole on his Twitter. I urge everyone to check out Colossal is Crazy's interview with Lion Maker. It's surreal. Yeah, I mean, and he went to jail, and he then he deserved to go to jail. Like, which is whatever. Um, but I, I mean, I'm just trying to use the example of, like, when it was be before he got prosecuted and whatever. People ripping him apart, like, we didn't know. Like, actually know. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. Now, I can honestly go on and on all day about Anissa's shitty behavior, but I'll try and summarize it all the best I can. She has a history of flirting with other guys, like Chris Raygun, while also bullying his girlfriend, Lacey Green, has traced over other people's art, thinks ISIS isn't real, tried justifying the inhumane experiments conducted during the Holocaust. Uh, as terrible as the Holocaust was, obviously it was horrendous and how dis like disgusting the doctor was that did the experiments on um, people, it was gay people, handicaps, twins. I think that's 
uh, and obviously they were obviously Jewish, um, or they did it on Jewish people. They found a couple of really groundbreaking discoveries through that exper experimentation. Constantly posts personal information about Ian and doxed him at one point, threatened to break up with him over the fact that he was on vacation filming the rice gum content cop, has criticized other girls for being sluts despite being one herself, constantly talks about her eating disorder despite making fun of other girls' physical appearances, this even involved calling Brittany Venti an ape, and loads more. That was just the most notable sins of hers up until 2020. I wasn't really going to go too hard on Anissa for this video, but after doing some research, I changed my mind. She's always been a horrible person, and this OnlyFans drama just opened people's eyes to that fact. Following this, Ian continued uploading more rant videos, like a bizarre one on people's music tastes. In July 2020, he would release his second documentary, titled Ice Cream Man. In it, he documents the washed-up YouTuber Daxflame, who you will know for this meme. Now, unlike the previous doc, it wasn't received as well. In my opinion, it's just kind of boring. Dax Flame isn't interesting enough for a 50 minute long documentary, proven by the fact that half of it is just a lame game show. With, I'm Dax Flame, and one quick fact about me is I hate cereal, ice cream, and popcorn. With me today are Brett and Letty. Can you please tell me each uh, one quick fact about yourself and also how old you are and your job? It unravels too much of the Dax Flame's character, removing what made him interesting to begin with. I legitimately struggled watching this for the first time, it's just so uninteresting. Though it's still received over 7 million views, only a third of the views full force did. Along with all the weird jumbled rant videos, Ian still would post the occasional gem, like his Jeff the Logan video for mid-2021. Here he rips apart the shady dink doink cryptocurrency peddled by Logan Paul and his crew of cunts. It legit felt like a content cop episode, not just on Logan, but the company as well. I believe in this shit. I think it's gonna go crazy. So of course you believe in it! Because it would be illegal for you to not believe in it. It's fucking dink doink, bro, and I'm ready to start sucking some dink. I'll see <laughs> Awesome, dude. <laughs> He's keeping it cool! Logan's keeping it cool! Yeah, it's just like Doge. Grassroots. Everyone loves the Doge, now everyone can love the dink doink. Something else notable about it is that Idubs announced his marriage with Anissa in one of those Las Vegas weddings. People soon found out that he took her last name, now being Ian Joma. Money Online made fun of this, as it's pretty bizarre for the man to take his wife's last name. Ian's upload schedule would get even stranger from this point forward, going from uploading 17 videos in 2019, to 11 in 2020, and only 5 in 2021. Though obviously he was spending loads of time uploading his high quality documentaries, the weird thing is, he never uploaded one in 2021. I ain't saying she a cold no broke knees. On January 8th, 2022, Sam Hyde released a two hour long video onto his Hyde Wars YouTube channel. Here he documents his experience working with iDubs for one of his videos, which was supposed to be released the year before. But for some reason, Ian never posted it. So as to not waste the $15,000 Sam spent for the iDubs documentary, he put together his own footage. Within a week, this video gained over a million views, leading to many questioning Ian on why he never uploaded his video. Well, he finally caved in and released Getting Away With It on February 2nd, 2022. It details Ian traveling to Rhode Island to visit Sam and the rest of Million Dollar Extreme, as to document their current endeavors after falling off years earlier. If you don't know, Million Dollar Extreme was able to make an Adult Swim show, which didn't last long as some of the executives thought it was too offensive. Sam knew that Ian was going there to just shit on him and wanted to switch things up. He made a list called The Blueprint for Gaslighting iDubs, which details ways to make things more uncomfortable for Ian. Record a lot of bad rap music, stage fright where Sam re-records breaths, insists the auto-tune's in the wrong key, super quiet ad-libs, like uh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> a song with the hook swag like high dubs. Oh. <laughs> Stage fight over who gets to use the alias Cream Boy. <laughs> um, keep fucking up takes and blame someone else. Sam rented out an old dentist's office and passed it off as his headquarters. The place was messy, computers were everywhere, copyright and music was blasting, and Sam hired an intimidating bodyguard. The best trolling effort of all was Danny, 
Sam's supposed girlfriend who was clearly being abused and on drugs. Idub showed great concern, not knowing that she was literally just some college student Sam hired to shave her head and act cracked out. This was revealed in the documentary's climax, the big interview, to which Idubs was stunned. Have you tried to get her any help? Uh, no, seeing as she's a girl, I paid $500 to shave her head and pretend to be my girlfriend. No, I haven't tried to get her any help. <laughs> Should you want me to try? Wait, okay. I don't know her that well. It's probably not my business to get her off drugs. Also, I think I told her to put her hand in your pocket and pretend to be on drugs. <laughs> Shut up! You think I... Are you serious? You think I would date a girl that has her hair shaved like that? Yes. You think I'm a fucking mental case? Yes. <laughs> no, actually, oh, I've known her for a long time. And, um, this this is I, so upsetting to me right now. You think I would, I'm a fucking millionaire. You think I have a shit ass office like this? I find it so odd that instead of being relieved, he's shown more pissed off, since he was clearly going to use this as evidence on Sam being a horrible person. Another example of that was the previously mentioned Brony Simulator fiasco, Sam's parody Kickstarter project which Ian made a video about. It was taken down by Sam, and it seems even years later, Ian was still holding a grudge over this. For seven years, he was mad at Sam for over some pony game. What did I do? Do you have any guesses? Did I say fuck you or something? Uh, no, you, you copyright claimed the video. Really? Yes. And then... You sent me an email. I mean, I don't do I don't do most copyright claims. What do, what was what was the email? The email was, I will release the copyright claim on your video if you can send me a video of yourself squatting 200 pounds below parallel. Why didn't you do that? You'd be so much stronger now if you'd done that. <laughs> yeah. Damn. The rest of the documentary was Ian chilling with Sam, boxing with him, and driving around in Sam's cool car. Though after filming that interview, the two barely spoke. In fact, Sam was avoiding Idubs since he was asking too much. Idubs was easily annoyed by this and left after the fifth day. Regardless, both Sam and Ian's videos are really good. Much of the footage shown was mutual, including some of the more embarrassing moments for Ian. Though Ian removed the parts of the interview that made Sam appear more genuine. I think it pops in your head when you're filming a video and you're like, Oh yeah, this would be a good thing to use as a prop in the moment. No. What makes Sam's documentary better was that Ian spent too much of his trying to explain Sam's humor. He went on this tangent about meta irony and explaining it with this wonky wheel, not understanding that Sam's humor mainly just comes off as him being a troll. Ian just didn't look that good in either video, which would make him insecure going forward. He was so blinded by hatred that he never even noticed what was really going on. After getting away with it was released, Sam praised it and was thankful for getting some new recognition. But the documentary was extremely well cut, it was neutral, it represented what happened. And um, I think that is, that's big, like character wise, to not, to not look for an angle to like uh, get revenge or something. I think it was, I think it's big-ish of him. Let's rewind things back to 2016. After releasing his content cop on Jinx, the latter was pretty upset. So much so that he wanted to fight Ian in a boxing match. Ian actually went through with this and released multiple videos of him training. The two were to meet in Philadelphia on March 4th, 2016, but Jinx never came. Ian then released another video mocking Jinx, ending with him placing a bucket hat on a grave. Jinx wasn't a great man. He wasn't even a good man. I'll never forget the time he said to me, I've been saying I want to fight your ass this month, all month, bitch boy. Don't try to manipulate these kids, boy. Jinx is a poet, a rapper, an entrepreneur, a businessman, and above all, a reactor. You'll be missed, Jinx. Years later, on October 29th, 2021, Ian released a video about him trying to set up a boxing match with Rice Gum, which didn't pan out. Rice had been wanting to fight Ian since the content cop was released, though Ian was finally up for it after Rice messaged Anissa in June 2021. Ian agreed, though refused to allow Keemstar to set up the event. Rice Gum ended up pussying out, which Ian was pissed about since he had gone to great lengths for this fight. He even got LASIK eye surgery, despite his glasses being such a huge part of his brand. He even asked Keemstar if he would want to fight, but Keem declined, wanting to fight Ethan Klein instead. So with the prospect of a charity boxing event in mind, Ian asked fans to suggest who else he should fight. It wouldn't be until March 25th, 2022 when Idubs announced who he would be fighting. 
Dr. Mike. We also announced that loads of other content creators would be fighting, mainly being people Ian was already a fan of. There was Harley Morenstein of Epic Mealtime fighting Aaron Hansen of Game Grumps, Graham Steven fighting Michael Reeves, I Did a Thing fighting The Odd Ones Out, Justin Minx fighting Yodeling Haley, AB of the H3 Podcast fighting Hundar of Muscle Party, Eric of Internet Common Etiquette fighting DJ Welch, Alex Ernst fighting Ryan McGee, and Matt Watson fighting Dad. Creator Clash, as it was called, would be held in Tampa, Florida on May 14th, 2022, with tickets being available starting with this announcement. More promotions would be posted, including one showcasing much of the talent involved, one of which, Harley, would end up training with Sam Hyde. Sam wanted to fight in Creator Clash, but was deemed too much of a business risk by iDubs. This was odd, especially since many saw Sam as the one who inspired Ian to do boxing in the first place. Sure, he had done it years earlier to train with Jinx, but doesn't it seem coincidental that Ian only became interested in it again after training with Sam? Either way, Sam still wanted to attend the event to support Harley, buying him and the MDE crew $10,000 worth of tickets for charity. On May 13th, the MDE crew pulled up to a mixer Ian was throwing before Crater Clash. Once arriving, Ian grew nervous and pulled Harley aside to have an intense conversation with him. So we're, we're talking to him and we're trying to reason. Here, here was Ian's A plan. He knew, he knew about the tickets before we pulled up. He was going to ban all of Sam's tickets, he was going to refund them, and none of us could come in. And it was going to be a surprise for when we first got there. Yeah, no gonna, he was going to wait until I, he was going to wait until I was in Tampa to spring that news on me. That was, that was his gift to you. That was his nice surprise gift. Yeah, ha ha! Made you come to Tampa. Who's the puppet master now, Samuel? Yep, Ian knew they were coming, but instead of settling this online, he waited until they traveled all the way to Tampa. Dick move, I know. No matter how much the crew insisted they weren't there to troll anyone, Ian and Anissa didn't care. Luckily, only Sam was kicked out of the event and the rest of the MDE were able to attend to support Harley and Ian. Following this, Sam and Jet Neptune would be interviewed about the event by Brandon Buckingham. This was a turning point for Sam, going from being supportive of Ian no matter what, to spilling the beans on all of Ian's dirty secrets. At the, at the tail end of the documentary, when he wasn't getting the footage that he wanted, he was really upset, like, like, a, like an angry, like, child. Like, he was pouting. He was fucking pouting in his car and shit, and he said, um, Usu uh, not to me, but to somebody on the crew, he said, usually I'm the puppet master in these situations. What? Yeah, he said 100% on God, he said that. Usually I'm the puppet master <laughs> in these situations. That's how he views himself? I dubs the yeah, puppet I guess, master? I guess so, man, I guess so. So anyway, I think that's where the anger comes from. I think that's why he doesn't, he doesn't want me at his um, boxing event. He would also begin making fun of Anissa after she did it first and after Anissa's own family reached out to talk shit. Yeah, Scorpion, because I flipped it on him when he came out here to make me look like an ass? I don't think so, Anissa. Bitch. Ho. Anissa. Try, try again, Anissa sweetie. Anissa or Anissa? It doesn't matter. Even, hey, <laughs> even, even your own family hates you, bitch. Anissa, Anissa's family hits me up. Her family, uh, I've, I've, been hit up, I've been hit up by her family members talking shit about her. Yeah? Yeah. Jesus, man. Even your own family hates you, bitch. I, what does that what does that say about you and how fucked up you are? They said they said that you used your uh, Alzheimer's father as a uh, like a, a a dramatic prop. That's what Creator Clash One was for. It was for Alzheimer's or something like that. Yeah. And Anissa, Anissa was up there like, oh, I'm just so happy we could raise all this money for Alzheimer's. One of her, one of your own fucking family members hit me up and said you don't care that much about your father and that your father has, you have like a strained relationship or something and that you don't care about Alzheimer's. So fuck you, bitch, ho, slut. Sam would continue occasionally making fun of the Jomas on his streams, which they both took note of. Despite that drama, Creator Clash was seen as a success. They sold over 10,000 seats and 100,000 pay-per-views, resulting in over $1.3 million being donated to charity. I mean, no matter how much you dislike iDubs at this point, you have to admit that's incredible. There was still a lot of hope for Ian, even from his haters. He of course lost the fight to Dr. Mike, which wasn't that surprising. Ian made a video addressing this over a week later, where he announced the possibility of Crater Clash 2 in 2023. Sam, meanwhile, was finally able to fight in a boxing match, fighting James Thompson as an undercard for KSI's two fights one night. Sam fought under his persona, the Candyman, an aggressive Irishman. He ended up winning the fight and called out professional hypocrite Hassan Piker. 
Have you got anyone you want to call out in the heavyweight division? Oh, you know it, lad. You know that Hassan Piker! I'm coming to kill you! In Los Angeles, at your house! Or in the ring? No, in real life. I'm going to stalk <laughs> him and become obsessed with him and wear his makeup and his dresses and use his skin as a coat like the ancient Irish did. Hassan would go on to ignore this proposal, and even lashed out against someone who brought it up at TwitchCon. Sam Hyde, he called you out on like a boxing event. Do you have, are you interested in like the boxing scene? Or no. I don't know why you guys are so into this shit. He's a Nazi. Like, I don't know. What? What's happening right now? It's so whack, bro. Like, I, I just, I don't understand why all you motherfuckers have to like run around with this shit. What's going on? What's going on? Nothing. Get the fuck out of my face, bro. You fucking asshole. Yeah, what do you mean, damn, bro? What, what the fuck do you mean, damn? What do you mean, damn? Anissa's mom is mad, so now I'm kicked out the event. Idubs didn't upload again until six months after Crater Clash 1 in November 2022. This was the start of a new series called The Hot Seat with Dax Flame, where Dax interviews random meme stars about their success. The first episode featured Airsoft Fatty, who was last seen in full force and sang the national anthem at Crater Clash. The second episode came out not too long after, featuring the girl from the It's Not The Vibe meme. Both of these are pretty boring, not gonna lie. Dax is just an uninteresting host, leading to not even the guest stars making it interesting. It was also weird how Ian didn't even appear in these at all despite going up on his main channel. The second episode performed way worse than the first, having only 600,000 views as of now. This is actually the first video of Ian's to gain less than a million views in years, and that streak would continue with his next few uploads before announcing Crater Clash 2. The trailer announced the event taking place on April 15th, 2023 in Tampa, just like the first event. Ian would be fighting against Alex Osabi this time, with way more fighters getting involved this time around. There was Harley once again, this time fighting John Hennigan, Myth fighting Hundar, Crank Gameplays fighting Lionheart, Dad fighting Starkilla, Jarvis Johnson fighting Aaron Hansen, Chris Raygun fighting Froggy Fresh, Haley Sharp fighting Marisha Ray, Alana Pierce fighting R.I.P. Micah, Abelina Sabrina fighting Jail Ray, Jack Manifold fighting Dakota Olive, and Andrea Botez fighting Michelle Carr. Chills, aka Dylan is chillin', was supposed to fight this year but it couldn't due to injury. The fan favorite of these was of course Froggy Fresh, who many will know under his old alias as Krispy Kreme. He was definitely the most prominent promoter of the event, even appearing on an episode of the official podcast in February to spread the word and gush about Ian. Um, Ian messaged me and was like, do you oh, want to so Ian buy? messaged you? Like, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, he messaged me and was like, hey, do you want to do, would you want to give this a shot? And, um... I was like, uh, honestly, I was scared. I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to box. Like, I was comfortable. I was fat and I was comfortable. I was trying <laughs> to be fat and comfortable. But then my wife said, like, you should do this. And I was like, you know what, I should. So, like, I was like, fuck it. But only a month after that, some drama between the two would emerge. On March 23rd, Froggy, aka Tyler, posted the following video to his Twitter. On April 15th, if I don't hurt you beyond what anybody could have imagined, I will be so disappointed in myself that I will subscribe to Elisa's OnlyFans. Seems pretty harmless, right? Well, apparently not, as only two days later, the Creator Clash Twitter account posted the following. There has been a change in the lineup, and Froggy Fresh will no longer be fighting against Chris Raygun. We will announce his replacement in the coming days. With just three weeks left, the countdown to Creator Clash 2 has begun. Creator Clash's goal is to make an inclusive and fun environment for the creators and fans while giving back to charity. That has always been our mission and Froggy Fresh's recent behavior does not align to that mission. We look forward to sharing this positive experience on April 15th. Yep, so only three weeks before the event they kicked out Froggy Fresh. And the comments were disabled on the post. Weird, right? Now many automatically assumed this was due to the OnlyFans joke he made, something Ian and Anissa were clearly not keen on anymore. Though the reason was also speculated to be because of a Twitter altercation Froggy had been having with someone going by the Pied Piper. This user kept belittling Froggy, calling him an imp. Froggy replied with the best possible response. Better imp than a pimp, shout out ya boy Idubs. Anissa come get your mom. 
Wait, what was that? Is this person Anissa Joma's mother? Well, after further research, it turns out that was completely true. Though shortly after this, her Twitter account was deleted. Froggy would soon release a song, persuading the event's organizers to let him back in, which didn't work. Anissa's mom is mad, so now I'm kicked out the event. Give the people their money's worth, and give them what they want. Give it all to charity for all the tickets that they bought. On March 28th, the Creator Clash Twitter account posted another message, this time trying to elaborate further on why they kicked Froggy. The thing is, this barely explained anything. It just mentions that certain actions of his violated their rules, and that they wanted the event to be nice and safe for everyone. The whole thing feels like a bloated essay trying to reach the minimum word count, or was written by ChatGBT. It doesn't go into specifics, only leading to further speculation. Many large creators, such as Critical and Some Ordinary Gamers, showed their disappointment with the Jomas. Sam Hyde, who briefly trained Froggy Fresh for the event, even offered a large sum of money to let him back in. He would become Tyler's biggest defender, against those like Harley who was trying to defend the Jomas. Tyler even claimed that he was being sued by the organizers over $15,000 he spent on training over the previous five months. Mudahar even offered to pay the legal fees, if this was actually going to happen. So who was going to fight Chris Raygun then? Well, it was this dude, William Haynes, a man much taller and bigger than Chris, who absolutely destroyed him in the ring. On May 3rd, Ian would finally release a video addressing the drama, which was not received well by many. I mean, it has more dislikes than likes, and is flooded with comments criticizing him over his many hypocrisies. He finally explained why he removed Froggy, because the man was training with Sam Hyde. The main reason Froggy was kicked from the card was for collaborating with Sam Hyde. And, you know, for anyone who's been following the story, that's, you know, fairly obvious. Uh, Froggy has explained, uh, you know, his side of the story multiple times. And uh, unfortunately, he's been perpetuating a narrative that it's about OnlyFans or that it's about Anissa's mom. And it, that's extremely deceptive because he knows why he was kicked from the card. The one indication I gave him was Sam Hyde, and I, I wasn't unclear about that. He mentions over and over that it's not because of the OnlyFans joke, despite the fact that most of the Sam Hyde clips he showed are of him making OnlyFans jokes. But look, how, look how beat she is. Oh, nice jack-o'-lantern teeth. That's like a I can't wait to see what she looks like when she's 32. Her teeth look like a, like a pumpkin head. Like it's the Anissa Joma hole stretcher. I'm sending this to Anissa's OnlyFans. It goes directly into charity. Yeah. Everybody hates him and his wife's a slut. Ian didn't want to bring up the drama on his end until now, which he says is partially due to not knowing how the response will be. Well, the only reason why he thinks that is because deep down he knows that he's in the wrong, but won't admit it due to his ego. He keeps perpetuating this narrative that making fun of his wife is drawing the line, despite saying only a few years earlier that he was fine with people making such jokes. Plus, she's a public figure, and she's been one since before they started dating. Now, Ian's also upset with how Sam Hyde is talking about his wife. That's reasonable, but the thing is, she's part of this too. She has her own online presence. She's also contributed to the content cops. She also shit talks online, even to the point where she needs her mom to fight her own battles, which is pretty fucking embarrassing, by the way. And my point is, she's involved. She's not some random person that was just brought into this. What's also funny is that Ian is crying about online harassment specifically regarding Sam Hyde when it's his fault this started in the first place by trying to make a hit piece documentary. It's fine for Ian to not want to associate with Sam, but the way he went about doing so was shady as fuck. He even tried showing these text messages Froggy had previously alluded to, and they don't make Ian look good. He keeps going on and on about how Sam hadn't been horrible to him, though says it's fine to train with him. Froggy is confused and tries to get a straight answer out of him, which leads to a complete ego trip. So I'm going to schedule practice this week, not knowing whether or not you're allowing me to fight in the event, because I'm going to hang out with someone you don't like? Okay. I dubs his response. Fucking <laughs> 12 minutes later is, I don't understand why you're talking to me like this. Like, what kind of fucking ego do you have to have to say that, dude? The main reason why Ian is in the wrong is due to his communication skills. He never gave anyone direct answers, had his wife give out vague public statements, and gaslit Froggy Fresh. If he was straightforward about everything from the start, the drama would have never been so severe. He could have simply said why he removed Froggy and went on with his life. Creator Clash is his event. He can choose to not have it associated with people he doesn't like. But this whole thing was egregious on his end, and further caused Ian's reputation to go down the toilet. He even tried to assert that Froggy is a misogynist due to some of his jokes poking fun at sex workers. 
I don't think Froggy respects sex workers. I think he has some really old, tired opinions about people who do sex work. I think he has uh, a lot of weird opinions as well about masculinity and shit. Ian's masculinity had been completely removed via Anissa. A lot of it's not explicitly said, but when you listen to the jokes, it's like, oh, that that's actually just your opinion phrased in a comedic way. There was some type of nerd fight last year, and Chris Raygun and all these people, it's like some big ethot worshiping party at these things, and I don't get it. I don't get what all this shit is all about, but everybody's there to worship ethots or fucking ethot or get or like touching ethots titty or pussy. Or, <laughs> it's always after that, and it's just like, Yep, this guy hates women. I do think women are a lot tougher than men in general. Yeah, but that's like, true, definitely. Emotionally, emotionally, like women are so much tougher than men. Like emotionally, in general. So what do you like, what do you think men are good at? Because you've said they're better at talking to people, <laughs> they're better at being tougher. What killing. do you like about men? Wait, hold on. Hold on. I said men are better at talking to people? No, you said women are better at talking to people and they're tougher. Oh, yeah. It's like, that doesn't sound like they're better at talking to people. I think men are generally, I think gener generally, what are men better at? Yeah. They have better shoulders, right? Yeah. He also shows a bunch of clips of Froggy shit talking Crater Clash during the drama and lies about them coming out before the drama. This is easily Ida's worst video and was followed up by another controversial drama field video that I want to discuss more in the next chapter. Because what I next need to bring up is how big of a failure Crater Clash 2 really was. On July 3rd, Ian released The Harsh Reality of Crater Clash 2. In it, he discussed the monumental failure the event was due to losing $250,000. Despite being a charity event, no money was able to be donated. Unfortunately, we didn't even reach the break-even point. Right? We're $250,000 in the red. I foolishly thought that the success of last year would, should be a minimum, you know, a minimum for what we are able to do this year. And that wasn't true. Ian spent much of the video blaming the loss on pirating, though fails to mention other big reasons why it failed, such as the negative press from kicking out Froggy, not promoting it that much, and biggest of all, wasting much of the money on personal expenses. He brags about buying out an entire hotel in Tampa because the prices were about to go up due to a Taylor Swift concert about to happen there. He also held four different parties before and after Crater Clash and flew out a bunch of random influencers to show up and get pictures taken. Basically, there were hundreds of invited creators. They got their tickets for free, the event paid for their flights to Florida, and you know these fuckers weren't flying coach. So that's like, what, $2,000 each if they paid for a return flight? And the event bought out the Floridan Palace for $150,000, so they had a place to stay. These creators had nothing to do with the event and weren't associated with the event in any capacity. Examples of these creators include Hassan Piker, Frogan, Jax Films, Denims, Gus Johnson's friend, that guy that made the Ching Chong Hanji Poli Wong Patang Yang Chika Bang Patang Yang Bang Chinese joke. I find it funny that these multi-millionaires had to be paid to show their support for a charity event. Tens of thousands of dollars wasted so Anissa could talk to her favorite Twitch streamers. Also, I'm sure a lot more money was spent on security this year since Sam Hyde joked about showing up in drag to sneak in. He of course never came, though many others were kicked out for simply wearing costumes. They hired a comedian to give a quick stand-up routine for $20,000. And you wonder why so many people are accusing the Jomas of pocketing the money. He wasted so much of it and wonders why he lost a quarter of a million dollars. By the way, Career Clash isn't registered as a non-profit organization, it's a for-profit. If it was a non-profit, they would have to publish their finances. Only half as many showed up compared to last year, partially because it wasn't advertised that well. Only two videos are posted about it, Many refunded their tickets and donated money directly to charity due to the froggy drama, and people barely knew who the fighters were. The reason why people are into influencer boxing is because of the influencers themselves, not the skill levels involved. You want to see Wings of Redemption fight Boogie because of the spectacle of it, not because they're good at fighting. Besides Tyler, Harley, Chris, and Alex, who even cares about these other fighters? A lot of them are channels of only a few hundred thousand subscribers, and barely get any views. Is it any wonder that the event failed? What makes it worse is that he promised the charities, such as a kid's cancer foundation, a lot more money than he actually paid them. And when he was caught with his pants down and couldn't pay out the money that he promised, he practically ghosted them and didn't address it whatsoever. It was only until they contacted him via email inquiring about the money that he gave any clarification that they wouldn't receive anymore. And this was only hours before he uploaded his new video. 
I find it hilarious how Ian keeps saying that Sam Hyde is a business risk, when this event proved the opposite. Around the same time all this drama was going down, Sam released his livestream show, Fish Tank Live. It was a massive success and made him loads of money. How much money, you ask? 1.3 million dollars. Yeah, I ask again, who's the bigger business risk? Following the video, Froggy would show proof of him being sued by the event and mention that the money he used to train was from his own pocket, not from the event. Idos would announce a 24-hour livestream in order to make back the money. He did this on Twitch, despite having a much smaller audience there. Ian had a goal of raising $250,000, half of which, Anissa claims, will go to pay off the expenses. She also publicly embarrassed him on stream for no reason at all. Well, if you can. I just want to ask you if you've always been shitting your pants. No. Because since I've known you, you've always had, like, IBS. You've always been shitting yourself. Yeah, well... Honestly, I can care less about Ian having IBS. It's the fact that she revealed such information like this that pisses me off. I can't imagine doing that to somebody I love. And while some money was given to charity, it was given to the Critical Role Foundation, owned by Marisha Ray, one of this year's fighters. The two are friends, and many of the charities the Critical Role Foundation gives money to are a bit shady. So will there be a Crater Clash 3? It seems like it. Ian might be fighting Leafy, though I doubt this will actually happen due to his online behavior. He makes post after post trying to troll the transgender community, and might be trained by Sam Hyde. Though if this event does happen, many changes need to be made. Even if iDubs does devote all of his time and effort to Creator Clash 3, I don't see how that would help, because that's basically what he did for Creator Clash 2, and that was a failure. And how would they handle the PR for Creator Clash 3? Make it even more sanitized? They'll be mocked relentlessly. So I say, sell Creator Clash, get it away from the iDubs name, give it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Maybe that will give iDubs the space he desperately needs to start fixing his image. You know, I'm not, I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> During all the Crater Clash 2 drama, iDubs released a video titled, I Miss the Old iDubs, on May 18th, 2023. And, oh boy, I haven't seen a video this divisive in a long time. It's an apology to those he thinks were negatively affected by his old content, specifically the Content Cop series. He thinks this content promoted cruelty and bigotry, which in my and many other people's opinions is hyperbolic or flat out untrue. Ian thinks he was morally grandstanding in those content cops, despite the fact that he disproved this notion in the Rice Gum episode. Well, you have some pretty horrible comprehension because I was hardly calling you out for it. I used it as a point to illustrate that you can be criticized for it. I didn't say that I'm morally superior to you. I go on to argue that his recent activities would count as morally grandstanding, since whenever he gets criticized, he brings up his charity work and attempts to change. He then apologizes to everyone he made videos on, though still has the balls to remark that he doesn't like any of them still. In particular, he name drops Tana, since she was the only one Ian harassed in person. I'm sorry to everyone that I made content cop videos on. I, I still don't like the majority of you, and that's fine, but I can recognize that you did not deserve the hate and harassment that I sent your way. I, I particularly want to apologize to Tana. Tana, I'm sorry. I should have never made that video. I harassed Tana in person and then harassed her online, and that's deplorable behavior. If iDubs broke both of his legs and lost all of his subscribers, I would be genuinely happy. Also, I have to ask him, what about Content Cop was so inhumanely cruel? He rightfully criticized horrible YouTubers. These weren't innocent people. Tana lied about him and sent her fans to harass him. Leafy was bullying children, yet couldn't take criticism himself. The Fine Brothers wanted to trademark the term React. Jinx stole content and made a profit off that. Rice Gum scammed his fans on numerous occasions and broke people's property over petty beef. And Keemstar is Keemstar. Ah! I find this the most hypocritical statement in the video since his more recent content could be described as cruel. His Froggy Fresh video was basically a content cop on the guy where he lied about his supposed evidence and mislabeled him a misogynist. And in the Thanos video, he made a joke at the expense of the disabled. Sort of fed up with life kind of face. That's fetal alcohol syndrome face. Hey guys, quit picking on me. Quit picking on me because I'm British. Now, I personally don't think that joke is cruel, but according to his new logic, it is. He also brings up his use of slurs in the past, and how even though he used them jokingly, it was still racist of him. I was being very bigoted in a lot of my videos, and I justified it because 
you know, I didn't think it was too serious. And I thought that people were going to see that I had good intentions, you know, but that's so silly, you know. Casual racism is still racism. Casual bigotry is still bigotry. And, you know, I said a lot of things that uh, I, I look back at and I cringe now and I'm like, that is an awful thing to say. It, it doesn't matter what my intentions are. Like, if I'm hurting people, I'm hurting people. Yes, it does matter what your intentions were. You use the gamer word in order to show Tana's hypocrisy, not to influence others to say it. I showed this clip earlier in the video, but I'll show it again. And if you're a very observant person, you might notice a video from a year ago where I actually critique the use of the word when I'm doing a bad unboxing. The, the whole joke here is the nigger word. Let's laugh out loud in the comments, you guys. <laughs> it's incredible how much more intelligent you would have looked if during the event where I came and said, say nigger, if you just said, wow, you're a very uncomfortable person and you're not very funny. What a pathetic joke. You would have just destroyed me. I mentioned this in my last video about the show Jerk Beast, but if you think your humor's old content influenced people to be bigoted and racist, you're incorrect. A morally good person isn't going to be easily influenced by someone using a slur. The only ones who are going to be seriously influenced by that are the few in society that were already bigots. Ian cites an incident where a fan came up to him at a convention. The person was trans and randomly assumed Ian didn't want to talk to them because of that fact. And this particular fan came up to me and said, I know you probably don't like transgender people, but can I, you know, get a picture? That smacked me in the face. I was like, oh, holy shit. Why would you think that? But I mean, it was fairly obvious. I was being cruel, hateful, bigoted, and uh, being very uncaring about people's feelings. So what about Ian's content made this random fan think he was a transphobe? Would this be it? I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> Gourmet meals. That right. What are you fucking gay? <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> he also brings up his interview of Anthony Padilla, where he says this about his old fan base. Some people were, as I described earlier, were very much like antisocial, weird basement dwellers, and you know, the one time a month that they come out of their cave is going to restock on supplies at Walmart, and they run into me, their favorite YouTuber. Which is kind of the lifestyle you were living in the Yeah, time. exactly. <laughs> As many have pointed out, this feels like Ian pulling up the ladder. He hates his old fan base despite being the reason why he became successful in the first place. He claims that now, at the age of 32, has learned empathy. It's such a weird statement, like, now you're gonna have emotions or something? It's fucking bizarre. It's not like he was a teenager when he made the content cops, he was in his mid-twenties. So the feedback to this video is all over the place. Many commentary channels began making responses, poking holes in his narrative. It sounds really pathetic to say at the age of 32, I've acquired empathy. Oh, I've developed empathy at the age of 32. It's an absolute cop-out. Sure, he's allowed to change the direction of his content, etc., but this entire charade of a change of character is politically charged, and the result of him moving into social circles where he believes that having his former reputation is a threat to his ability to be a social climber. The comments were filled with very nuanced takes, like how his fans don't think his old content was that bad, but that they're happy he's taking steps to change. Definitely the most popular response to this was Criticals, who also gave some incredibly nuanced takes to it. He wasn't happy with the content he made or the person he was, and now he's trying to apologize for the videos he made. And I, once again, have to completely disagree with the way he looks at it. I feel like his perspective on it is very warped by the way the internet has evolved over the years. The way he talks about this content makes it sound like he used to fucking murder puppies for these videos, which it was never that extreme. I very much would consider it edgy. It was 2016 edginess in all of its glory. Uh, that was entirely the brand. And for its time, it lived peacefully. You know, all four nations, water, earth, fire, air, lived together in harmony with all this edginess going on. Though many of Ian's newer fans caught wind of this, and began spamming the comment section with the same, almost copy-paste story of how iDub's old content influenced an entire generation to be racist assholes. A lot of the people on Twitter also posted these stories, which were criticized. Many comments say that they were 16 at the time and enjoyed anti-SJW content, but now they've escaped the alt-right pipeline and they walk a civilized path and they consume mature content. And I'm like, well damn, let's see what the next step of entertainment is, and I click on their channels and see that they're subscribed to Hassan Piker and Vorge 
and H3. And I'm left wondering, well, what exactly is maturing to you? And then I realize, oh no, you still like being offensive. You still like being vitriolic. You like bullying. You've just politically realigned. A lot of figures in the far left use this drama as an excuse to push their political views, condemning those giving fair and nuanced opinions. Most notable in this category was D'Angelo Wallace, a generic red tuber who responded to Critical's video. In it, he claims that Charlie is wrong due to the video not being made for him. It comes off as really odd, as if Charlie can't have an opinion on this due to being a straight white guy. D'Angelo also did not research on iDubs. I can guarantee he never watched his content before, as he makes false assessments of the content cops. Biggest of all is when he claims that the Leafy episode is mostly just making fun of his appearance. The reason why he did that, D'Angelo, is because he was giving Leafy his own medicine. He was bullying Leafy the same way Leafy bullies other people. It was to show how much of a pussy the guy was. D'Angelo doesn't care about Ian's situation. He just used it to prop up his political views and virtue signal to his echo chamber of an audience. His, and many other sentiments, were that the only ones defending iDubs were the racist alt-right losers, despite the fact that people were making fun of him from all sides. Four individuals Ian made content cops responded to him. Rice, Keem, and Leafy mainly just made fun of him, while Tana gave a mature response. She thinks she deserved being content copped on and doesn't think he should apologize. You need to be held accountable for actions. You, I don't know, like it, it, like it made me do so much necessary growth and I think it also changed the entire trajectory of my career in life. And so I guess because of how much I wouldn't go back in time and like change anything, I've never like felt like I like deserved an apology. For I still really hate Tana, but I have to respect her for this. Rare Tana W. The reason why she is saying this and that she feels she deserves it is because 99% of that video is calling her out on her hypocrisy, bullshit, and overall making good criticism of her. And as you guys know, that's always been my main problem with this whole item situation. It's fine if he changes, as I've said multiple times, but just don't misrepresent your past videos to such an extent talking about how you just spammed slurs. That wasn't your content at all, and it's an insult to try to reduce it to just that. Colossal is crazy, a well-known commentary channel, offered to interview Ian about the situation, but he refused. In July, Ian would be interviewed by this chick, Olay. It's okay if you don't know who she is, she's a really small creator. Basically, she's a far-left activist who looks at everything with the lens of race. She first talks to Francesca Ramsey, who alleges Ian made a video on her years ago. Not even old fans of iDubs are able to recall such a video, so it seems like bullshit. Ian really only did this interview because he knew she politically aligned with him. She does a terrible job and brings up race any way she can. The narrative will still be that a white woman was centered in all of this and that ultimately you're apologizing for saying a racial slur, a black racial slur to a white lady. <laughs> um. She criticized him for only naming Tana in the apology and thinks he should have named Jinx too. Why Jinx? Well because he's black of course. She thinks iDubs ruined his career, despite the fact this idiot literally made reaction videos. Olay claims that the apology will never be enough, and that he should be giving the revenue he's made to Jinx and others like him. Reparations, if you will. Obviously Ian can't do that, cause he lost 250,000k. The only person that I've really seen take any real measurable responsibility is Jenna Marbles. She said, I'm out. If we had the ability to cancel you, you wouldn't have been successful in the first place. An, an apology is is not enough for me. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think there's anything that he can do that will ever be enough. If it's never going to be enough, if they've been wanting to cancel him and ruin his career, if their best example of a creator taking accountability is leaving the internet, then it's clear they're not looking for any real form of reconciliation. They just want the power they think iDubs has to be able to scare people off the internet. The thing they were complaining about him doing to Jinx. If this is how they're going to treat these situations, then there's no reason to apologize in these circumstances, because it seems like their end goal is to silence you completely. Like they said, the most accountable they've ever seen a creator be is when they left the internet entirely. But if they can get some reparations first, well, that works too. Let me be clear. I think it's reasonably understandable for iDubs to want to change. What's not fine is for him to misrepresent it just for political brownie points. Money posit the theory that Anissa influenced him to be this way, and while I do agree with that to some extent, I'd say others like Asan and Ethan influenced him just as much. Ethan has a very similar situation to Ian. They both made content making fun of people, a lot of whom are SJWs, but realized that it would be more profitable to target to those people. This isn't a good strategy, as at any sign of controversy they will dogpile on you. 
These are fans that hate nuanced conversation, and think that every conversation is black and white. If you don't 100% agree with me, you're against me. Especially in this situation, these fans are against nuance. They think that if you agree with someone with slightly different views, you will go down the alt-right pipeline. My name is Tabitha Tenenbaum. I'm a wibbly-wobbly, transgendered, queer, autistic, chatterbait user. And I'm a first-generation college student. And I also have degenerative bowel syndrome and a pulmonary embolism and a bit of a coronary. Last semester, I drowned my cat in a bathtub and I felt nothing. I also have sticky lip syndrome. Again, change is good, but the way Ian has tried to change is not good. He's doing it by spitting on those who used to support him. Look at PewDiePie. The guy was under lots of controversy back in 2017, but his content is seen as matured now. He didn't gain this reputation by saying it over and over again. He earned it. Unless he shows true signs of change, he won't be respected fully. And I like the changes he was making around 2018 to 2019. Despite the rocky relationship Chris and Ian have now, the documentary they made is incredible. His other content at the time was still about as good as his 2016 stuff. A big reason why is his persona and charisma. In the I Miss the Old Idubs video, he says he doubts his ability to entertain people on the basis of his personality, despite the fact that he had been doing so for years. His bad unboxing series wouldn't be as good without his personality. Same could be said for his other shows. His content nowadays sucks because it lacks personality. It's boring and uninspired, not because of the topics, but because of him. He looks drained and seems like he only makes videos for the money. I'd say his recent content is a big reason why he's been bleeding subscribers. He'd be making good views regardless of the drama if his new videos were good, but they suck. I want to once again talk about the Anissa stuff. She's not hated because of the OnlyFans drama, she's hated because of her persona. She comes across as this whiny, insecure, attention-seeking bitch who never apologizes for her actions. Despite taking so much of the credit for the Tana video, she never said sorry for it. She also never addressed the Creator Clash 2 drama formally. She always talks for Ian in interviews, yet hides behind him once they get backlash. And again, she dated a 17-year-old. I now think Sam Hyde is right when he refers to her as Yoko Ono. Now, despite my current hate for Ian right now, I still hope Creator Clash 3 does better than the previous. I think it would be awesome to see Ian finally win a fight, especially against Leafy. Oh, and maybe Anissa will fight this time. She's made lame excuses for not fighting at the last two events. My suggestion for the matchup? Anissa vs. Sylvia from Fish Tank Live. Anissa, I'm sorry to hear this, you have to hear this from me, but um, I'm gonna fight you. No, 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 uh, I'm your I'm biggest also an OnlyFans model that is curvy and I have tattoos, so uh, let's get in the fucking ring. I wanted to end this video off on a very special announcement. My next video will be the first episode of my new series, Idiot Influencers, which will be very much inspired by Content Cop, though it will be a bit different. Not only will I be tackling YouTubers, but also streamers, TikTokers, Instagram users, and any other social media influencers. I would love suggestions for who I should cover in episode 2 and onwards, though not anyone super well known. Thanks for watching guys, and... Come on, Mario, let's go get the friends in. Rape is good. <laughs>